What makes us specifically human? The complexity of our language? Our problem solving strategies? You may be shocked by my suggestion that, in some very deep sense, language and some aspects of human problem solving are no more or less complex than the behaviors of other species. Complexity as such is not the issue. Spiders weave complex webs. Bees transmit complex information about sources and quality of nectar. Ants interact in complex colonies. Beavers build complex dams. Chimpanzees have complex problem-solving strategies, just as humans use complex language. Nor are our problem-solving skills so remarkable. There are human beings who have perfectly normal human mental abilities, but who nevertheless are unable to solve certain problems that a chimpanzee can solve. There is, however, one extremely important difference between human and non-human intelligence, a difference which distinguishes us from all other species. Unlike the spider, which stops at web weaving, the human child, and I maintain only the human child, has the potential to take its own representations as objects of cognitive attention. Normally, human children not only become efficient users of language, they also have the capacity to become little grammarians. By contrast, spiders, ants, beavers, and probably even chimpanzees do not have the potential to analyze their own knowledge. The clearest evidence for the role of color in sexual attraction among butterflies comes from studies of species in which males and females have distinctly different appearances. Obviously, to mate successfully, individuals must be able to determine whether other conspecific butterflies are of their own or of the opposite sex. The rest, it can be argued, is fine-tuning. A gorgeous butterfly species whose males and females differ in color is the little yellow, Eurema lisa. Both sexes appear in identical yellow to the human eye, the shade being produced by pigments in the tiny scales that cover the butterfly's translucent wings. Males and females look quite different to butterflies, however, which perceive light at wavelengths beyond the human visible range and into the ultraviolet. Yellow wing scales on the upper surface of the male's wings reflect ultraviolet light, and those of females do not. On encountering a female, a little yellow male flutters about her briefly before landing and attempting to copulate. On confronting another male, he speeds away and continues his search. These simple behaviors allowed me to develop a test for the cues males use to recognize females. I first glued little yellow wings to cards and presented them to males. Males landed on and even attempted to copulate with female wings. But male study subjects paid scant attention to male wings similarly mounted. The next phase of the experiment showed that color was responsible for this choice. I prepared a card with two sets of male wings, a quartz slide that transmits both visible and ultraviolet light, covered one set of wings, and a filter that blocks ultraviolet wavelengths overlaid the other. Males now attempted to mate with the male wings under the filter, wings that appear to be female. It comes near to stating the obvious that all languages have developed to express the needs of their users, and that in a sense, all languages are equal. All languages meet the social and psychological needs of their speakers, are equally deserving of scientific study, and can provide us with valuable information about human nature and society. There are, however, several widely held misconceptions about languages which stem from a failure to recognize this view. The most important of these is the idea that there are such things as primitive languages, languages with a simple grammar, a few sounds, and a vocabulary of only a few hundred words, whose speakers have to compensate for their language's deficiencies through gestures. 
Speakers of primitive languages have often been thought to exist, and there has been a great deal of speculation about where they might live and what their problems might be. If they relied on gestures, how would they be able to communicate at night? Without abstract terms, how could they possibly develop moral or religious belief? In the 19th century, such questions were common. And it was widely thought that it was only a matter of time before explorers would discover a genuinely primitive language. The fact of the matter is that every culture which has been investigated, no matter how primitive it may be in cultural terms, turns out to have a fully developed language, with a complexity comparable to those of the so called civilized nations. There are no Bronze Age or Stone Age languages. Humans couldn't always easily produce F and V sounds, according to a surprising new study. The reason we can now enjoy words like flavor and effervescent, say the researchers, has to do with changes to the ancestral human diet and the introduction of soft foods, a development that altered the way we bite, and by consequence, the way we talk. Human speech involves all sorts of wacky noises. From the ubiquitous M and A sounds found in virtually all languages to the rare click consonants expressed in some South African dialects. Anthropologists and linguists have traditionally assumed that the inventory of all possible speech sounds used by humans has remained unchanged since our species emerged some 300,000 years ago. But new research published today in Science. Is challenging this long held assumption. An interdisciplinary research team led by Damien Blasi from the University of Zurich is claiming that F and V sounds were only recently introduced into the human lexicon, emerging as a side effect of the agricultural revolution. These sounds, which are now present in the vast majority of all human languages, are what linguists call. Labiodental consonants, sounds produced by pressing our upper teeth to our lower lip. Here's the story as presented in the new study. Around 8,000 years ago, as humans transitioned from predominantly meat eating lifestyles to agriculture, the foods our ancestors ate became softer, which had a pronounced effect on the human bite. Instead of the edge on edge bite exhibited by hunter gatherers, Who had to tear into tough meat. Agricultural humans retained the juvenile overbite that usually disappears by adulthood. With the upper teeth slightly in front of the lower teeth, it became much easier to make labial dental sounds. Gradually and quite by accident, these sounds were integrated into words, which eventually spread across time and space. Most notably within the last 2,500 years. Anger is an emotional state that varies in intensity from mild irritation to intense fury and rage, according to Charles Spielberger, a psychologist who specializes in the study of anger. Like other emotions, it is accompanied by physiological and biological changes. When you get angry, Your heart rate and blood pressure go up, as do the levels of your energy hormones and adrenaline. Anger can be caused by both external and internal events. You could be angry at a specific person, such as a co worker or supervisor, or event, a traffic jam or a canceled flight, or your anger could be caused by worrying about your personal problems. Memories of traumatic or enraging events can also trigger angry feelings. The instinctive, natural way to express anger is to respond aggressively. Anger is a natural, adaptive response to threats. It inspires powerful, often aggressive feelings and behaviors, which allow us to fight and to defend ourselves when we are attacked. A certain amount of anger, therefore, is necessary to our survival. On the other hand, we can't physically attack every person or object that irritates us. Laws, social norms, and common sense 
place limits on how far our anger can take us. Being funny is possibly one of the best things you can do for your health. You can almost think of a sense of humor as your mind's immune system. People at risk for depression tend to fall into depressive episodes when exposed to some kind of negative stimuli, and afterwards, it becomes easier and easier for them to relapse into depression. However, reframing a negative event in a humorous light acts as a kind of emotional filter, preventing the negativity from triggering a depressive episode. Humor doesn't just guard against depression. It also improves people's overall quality of life. Researchers have found that people who score highly in certain types of humor have better self-esteem, more positive affect, greater self-competency, more control over anxiety, and better performance in social interactions. Not all kinds of humor are made equal, however. In the same study, the researchers identified four types of humor. Affiliative humor, or humor designed to strengthen social bonds. Self-enhancing humor, which is akin to having a humorous view of life in general. Aggressive humor, such as mocking others. And self-defeating humor, in which individuals encourage jokes that self-deprecate or have themselves as the target. The positive contributions mentioned above only occurred when individuals scored highly in affiliative and self-enhancing humor, while aggressive and self-defeating humor was associated with poor overall well-being and higher anxiety and depression. So when cultivating your sense of humor, it's important to strive for the right kind. Besides, it's a crummy thing to make fun of others anyhow. In addition to working as a mental immune system, research has shown that humor can actually improve your physical immune system. Laughter can also improve cardiovascular health and lowers heart rates, blood pressure, and muscular tension. Aside from improving your health, laughter can be a productivity tool as well. A study from Northeastern University found that volunteers who watched a comedy were measurably better at solving a word association puzzle that relied on creative thinking as compared to control groups that watched horror films or quantum physics lectures. Another study measured people's performance on a brainstorming task and found that participants who were asked to come up with a New Yorker-style caption generated 20% more ideas than those who did not. People generally know soon enough when they are dehydrated, in need of food, or exposed to some kind of noxious stimulus. They start experiencing unpleasant subjective feelings, such as thirst, hunger, and pain, which goad them into taking appropriate corrective action. Messages of this kind have also evolved to notify us when we are separated from and in need of close, affectionate contact with others. These messages are often collectively referred to as loneliness. Loneliness is something that nearly everyone experiences at some stage during their lives, and it can be caused by almost any event involving a change in the quality or number of one's social relationships. The death of a close friend or relative or a divorce or separation are extreme examples, although even relatively minor upheavals can also create profound distress. Moving to a new neighborhood, a new school, or a new job, even a change in status, such as a promotion at work, can result in moderate to severe bouts of loneliness. People vary markedly in how susceptible they are to the feelings of isolation associated with loneliness. When human subjects have been isolated in featureless rooms as part of psychological experiments, some have managed to remain for periods of up to eight days without feeling anything more than slight nervousness or unease. 
others have been ready to batter the door down within a few hours. Loneliness must also be clearly distinguished from the state of being alone. The latter may be actively sought out and enjoyed. The former is always a negative concept. Hence, it is possible for a person to be alone yet contented hundreds of miles from the nearest human being, while the same individual may feel desolate with loneliness in the middle of a large crowd of people. In this respect, loneliness differs from the symptoms of physical deprivation. Violence results from humanity's feeling of impotence. The loss of individual and personal meaning in our age ensures a corresponding violence from those who are deprived of their identities. For violence, whether spiritual or physical, is a quest for identity and the meaningful. The less identity, the more violence. It's why they have to kill in order to find out whether they are real. This is where the violence comes from. This meaningless killing around our streets is the work of people who have lost all identity and who have to kill in order to know if they are real or if the other person is real. Violence as a form of quest for identity is one thing that people who have been ripped off feel the need of. Such a person is going to show who he is or that she's tough. So anybody on a psychic frontier tends to get tough or violent, and it's happening to us on a mass scale today. It might even be said that in a society which proceeds at the speed of light, humankind has neither goals, objectives, nor private identity. A person is an item in a data bank, software only, easily forgotten, and deeply resentful. A person with humility has a confident yet modest sense of his or her own merits, but also an understanding of his or her limitations. The moment you think you have seen everything or know it all, nature senses arrogance and gives you a great big dose of humility. You must give up on the idea that you can ever become so enlightened that you have nothing left to learn. Zen masters know that even for them, learning never ends. Humility is the lesson that stings, for along with it usually comes some kind of loss or downfall. Nature likes to keep things in balance, so when an inflated ego ignores civility and patience, it introduces humility as a way to bring the ego back down to earth. Though the sting feels like a wound at the time, it really is just a poke from the higher power to keep you balanced. Some people experience so much success in life that they take it for granted, expecting things to go their way automatically. When this results in an inflated ego that ignores patience and civility, arrogance is bred and humility has to be taught. That is what happened to Will. Extremely handsome, tan, and athletic, with penetrating eyes, Will looked and dressed like a fashion model. Things came easily to him, and he mastered everything he tried. With his charm, intelligence, and talents, his business was lively and success was a way of life. So when Will was served a lawsuit one day, he assumed that the case would work out as easily as everything else in his life, and he didn't worry about it. But it didn't, and the suit eventually led to the breakup of his company. He tried for months afterward to get a job, but no one would hire him. His finances became strained, payments fell behind. And finally, bankruptcy was his only option. Will couldn't understand why his magic was no longer intact, and after seven years of various jobs that yielded no magic, he finally faced up to the lesson of humility. When he came to see me, 
Will couldn't understand how so much misfortune could come to a perfect person like him. He had to learn that his talents were wonderful, but were overshadowed alongside an attitude of arrogance. He looked down upon people who didn't have his gifts, speaking to them in a patronizing manner, treating them with impatience and annoyance, judging them as worthless or stupid. Over time, Will came to understand why life had given him so many intense lessons in humility. The lessons were difficult for him at first, but with understanding, Will made sense of his situation and committed to learning his lessons, and he turned his circumstances around. Have pride in who you are and what you have accomplished. However, if you find yourself holding secret thoughts of arrogance or self-importance, remind yourself of the lesson of humility before nature does it for you. It will sting much less that way. Many teachers and schools, in an attempt to be colorblind, do not want to acknowledge cultural or racial differences. I don't see black or white, a teacher will say. I see only students. This statement assumes that to be colorblind is to be fair, impartial, and objective because to see differences, in this line of reasoning, is to see what seems on the surface to be defects and inferiority. Although this sounds fair and honest and ethical, the opposite may actually be true. Color blindness may result in refusing to accept differences and therefore accepting the dominant culture as the norm. It may result in denying the very identity of our students, thereby making them invisible. What seems on the surface to be perfectly fair may in reality be fundamentally unfair. In the classic sense, being colorblind can mean being non-discriminatory in attitude and behavior, and in this sense, colorblindness is not a bad thing. However, too often it is used as a way to deny differences that help make us who we are. A good example was provided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1974. The San Francisco School Department was sued on behalf of Chinese-speaking students who, parents and other advocates charged, were not being provided with an equal education. The School Department, however, argued that they were indeed providing these students with an equal education because they had exactly the same teachers, instruction, and materials as all the other students. The U.S. Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, ruled against the school department. The dictum, equal is not the same, is useful here. It means that treating everyone in the same way will not necessarily lead to equality. Rather, it may end up perpetuating the inequality that already exists. Learning to affirm differences rather than deny them is what a multicultural perspective is about. At a recent professional meeting, a Stanford University researcher discussed the results of a test of the effects of a drug to control aggression. The trouble is that the research was carried out on juvenile inmates in a California prison, creating a lot of legal and ethical problems. The Stanford research gave groups of juvenile inmates varying doses of an anti-aggression drug and assessed its effect on their behavior. The controversy lies in the fact that the researcher reportedly admitted setting the dose so low as to be a placebo, intentionally denying the subjects any therapeutic effect from the drug. Federal regulations allow research in prisons under only very limited conditions, when there is a prospect of direct therapeutic benefit for the subjects. This means no placebo-controlled trials are allowed. Research in prisons was not always so limited. 
Before the early 1980s, prisoners were considered to be a popular research population. Prisoners offered a controlled environment. No prisoners would be lost to follow up. Prisoners were highly motivated subjects. Whether to earn extra money or other forms of payment, make up for previous behavior, or get better access to medical care. In fact, a study performed in the early 1980s demonstrated that research participation was a popular and highly valued activity. The most powerful inmates were the most likely to be research subjects. But such motivation is precisely why concerned regulators move to limit research participation by prisoners. How can subjects give truly voluntary consent in a setting where freedom is so severely constrained? In the case of the Stanford research, consent is doubly complicated by the fact that the prisoners were juveniles. The Stanford researcher has not yet commented on his motives, but he might have found inmates a desirable research population for a number of reasons. For research into ways to control aggression, whom is it better to study and who is more likely to benefit than aggressive prisoners? Deceitfully breaking the rules as he did, however, runs the risk of harming not only subjects. But the future of such research altogether. In experiments involving human subjects, a great many subtle influences can distort research results. One distortion arises from the Hawthorne effect. This refers to any situation in which the experimental conditions are such that the mere fact that the subject is aware of participating in an experiment is aware of the hypothesis. Or is receiving special attention tends to improve performance. The name came from studies carried out at the Hawthorne plant of the Western Electric Company. In one of these studies, the illumination of three departments in which employees inspected small parts, assembled electric relays, and wound coils was gradually increased. The production efficiency in all departments generally went up as the light intensity increased. Experimenters found, however, that upon decreasing the light intensity in a later experiment, the efficiency of the group continued to increase slowly but steadily. Further experiments with rest periods and varying the length of working days and weeks were also accompanied by gradual increases in efficiency. Whether the change in working conditions was for the better or for the worse, apparently the attention given the employees during the experiment was the major factor leading to the production gains. The verdict is in: food deserts don't drive nutritional disparities in the United States the way we thought. Over the past decade. Study after study has shown that differences in access to healthful food can't fully explain why wealthy Americans consume a healthier diet than poor Americans. If food deserts aren't to blame, then what is? I've spent the better part of a decade working to answer this question. I interviewed 73 California families, more than 150 parents and kids, and spent more than 100 hours. Observing their daily dietary habits, tagging along to grocery stores and drive-through windows, my research suggests that families' socioeconomic status affected not just their access to healthful food, but something even more fundamental: the meaning of food. Most of the parents I interviewed, poor and affluent, wanted their kids to eat nutritious food. And believed in the importance of a healthful diet, but parents were also constantly bombarded with requests for junk food from their kids. Across households, children asked for foods high in sugar, salt, and fat. They wanted Cheetos and Dr. Pepper, not broccoli and sweet potatoes. One mom echoed countless others when she told me that her kids always want junk. While both wealthy and poor kids asked for junk food, the parents responded differently to these pleas. An overwhelming majority of the wealthy parents 
told me that they routinely said no to requests for junk food. In 96% of high income families, at least one parent reported that they regularly declined such requests. Parents from poor families, however, almost always said yes to junk food. Only 13% of low income families had a parent that reported regularly declining their kids' requests. One reason for this disparity is that kids' food requests meant drastically different things to the parent. For parents raising their kids in poverty, having to say no was a part of daily life. Their financial circumstances forced them to deny their children's requests for a new pair of Nikes, say, or a trip to Disneyland all the time. This wasn't tough for the kids alone, it also left the poor parents feeling guilty and inadequate. Next to all the things poor parents truly couldn't afford, Junk food was something they could often say yes to. Poor parents told me they could almost always scrounge up a dollar to buy their kids a can of soda or a bag of chips. So, when poor parents could afford to oblige such requests, they did. Honoring requests for junk food allowed poor parents to show their children that they loved them, heard them, and could meet their needs. As one low income single mother told me, They want it, they'll get it. One day they'll know. They'll know I love them, and that's all that matters. Junk food purchases not only brought smiles to kids' faces, but also gave parents something equally vital a sense of worth and competence as parents in an environment where those feelings were constantly jeopardized. To wealthy parents, Kids' food requests meant something entirely different. Raising their kids in an affluent environment, wealthy parents were regularly able to meet most of their children's material needs and wants. Wealthy parents could almost always say yes, whether it was to the latest iPhone or a college education. With an abundance of opportunities to honor their kids' desires, High income parents could more readily stomach saying no to requests for junk food. Doing so wasn't always easy, but it also wasn't nearly as distressing for wealthy parents as for poor ones. Denying kids Skittles and Oreos wasn't just emotionally easier for wealthy parents, these parents also saw withholding junk food as an act of responsible parenting. Wealthy parents told me that saying no to kids' pleas for candy was a way to teach kids how to say no themselves. Wealthy parents denied junk food to instill healthful dietary habits, such as portion control, as well as more general values, such as willpower. How much salt do we eat? In the 1980s, before it was widely known to be associated with high blood pressure, Salt consumption in the United States was between 6 and 15 grams a day. The WHO target daily intake is 5 grams. National governments are happy to sanction higher levels, 6 grams in the UK, which are reprinted on many food packets. But we still eat more salt than this. On its website, the European Salt Producers Association proudly, if perhaps a little incautiously, Counts a figure of 8 grams a day per capita salt consumption. Americans still consume around 10 grams a day. The producers are vigorous in their defense of people's right to consume as much salt as they want, in tones that at times recall the tobacco lobby. There is no need for healthy people to reduce their salt intake, they insist, while casting doubt on studies linking sodium to high blood pressure. In some cases, they point out, elderly people have died apparently because they have not been getting enough salt. Although the 6 gram daily allowance applies to adults of all ages, the elderly are more susceptible to high blood pressure and so presumably more likely to act on heightened fears by cutting out salt. Not all people should automatically reduce their salt intake, therefore. But salt is not like smoking, because you aren't always aware of it when you indulge. The recommended daily allowance is well publicized, 
but this information is of little use if you cannot calculate your intake. This is almost impossible to do. Packaged foods have long been obliged to list their major ingredients, which often include salt, but they do not have to declare the relative amount of salt present. More recently, in response to concerns not only about salt, but also about fats and sugar, manufacturers have begun to include panels of nutrition information, and some also give overall guideline daily amounts of these dietary elements. In the UK, this apparently helpful gesture has been viewed as a preemptive measure to head off a traffic light scheme proposed in 2005 by the Food Standards Agency to display much more readily understood red, yellow, or green gratings for these substances. But even declaring salt content is not transparently done. Some global brands, such as Heinz and Kellogg's, responsibly give figures for salt, and for that salt in terms of its sodium content alone. Cereals are especially assiduous about displaying this information, perhaps because it is at breakfast that we are most likely to pause to consider our dietary health. But many products indicate salt only as sodium. In a sense, this is medically useful since sodium is the component of salt linked to high blood pressure. In America, the conventional wisdom of how to live healthily is full of axioms that long ago shed their origins. Drink eight glasses of water a day. Get eight hours of sleep. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. 2,000 calories a day is normal. Even people who don't regularly see a doctor are likely to have encountered this information, which forms the basis of a cultural shorthand. Take these boxes, and you're a healthy person. In the past decade, as pedometers have proliferated in smartphone apps and wearable fitness trackers, another benchmark has entered the lexicon. Take at least 10,000 steps a day, which is about 5 miles of walking for most people. As with many other American fitness norms, where this particular number came from has always been a little hazy. But that hasn't stopped it from becoming a default daily goal for some of the most popular activity trackers on the market. E. Min Lee, a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard University T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the lead author of a new study published this week in the Journal of the American Medical Association, began looking into the step rule because she was curious about where it came from. It turns out the original basis for this 10,000-step guideline was really a marketing strategy, she explains. In 1965, a Japanese company was selling pedometers, and they gave it a name that, in Japanese, means the 10,000-step meter. Based on conversations she's had with Japanese researchers, Lee believes that name was chosen for the product because the character for 10,000 looks sort of like a man walking. As far as she knows, the actual health merits of that number have never been validated by research. Scientific or not, this bit of branding ingenuity transmogrified into a pearl of wisdom that traveled around the globe over the next half century and eventually found its way onto the wrists and into the pockets of millions of Americans. In her research, Lee put it to the test by observing the step totals and mortality rates of more than 16,000 elderly American women. The study's results paint a more nuanced picture of the value of physical activity. The basic finding was that at 4,400 steps per day, these women had significantly lower mortality rates compared to the least active women, Lee explains. If they did more, their mortality rates continued to drop until they reached about 7,500 steps, at which point the rates leveled out. Ultimately, increasing daily physical activity by as little as 2,000 steps, less than a mile of walking, was associated with positive health outcomes for the elderly women. 
In the hierarchy of human needs, good health is right at the top. There's a reason we say "to your health" whenever we clink glasses. In the complicated world of politics, therefore, with numerous competing issues coming at us 24 hours a day, it's not surprising that concerns clearly relevant to our health and that of our families regularly rise to the top of our society's priority list. The effect of plastic on our health should be at the top of that list today, as Bruce Laurie and I explain in our book *Slow Death by Rubber Duck*. Once an issue transforms into a human health concern, it becomes far more likely to be taken up by our elected leaders, noticed by the general public, and consequently solved. The smoking debate followed this path. Once the focus became the damaging effects of secondhand smoke, i.e., it's not just the health of smokers at risk, but the health of all those around them, the momentum for change became impossible for even the most defiant cigarette companies to resist. What we are witnessing now is the genesis of another human health problem that I believe has the potential to dominate public debate over the next decade: the discovery that tiny plastic particles are permeating every human on Earth. Plastic, it turns out, never really disappears. In response to time and sunlight, or the action of waves. It just gets mushed into smaller and smaller bits. These microscopic particles then enter the food chain, air, and soil. In the past couple of years, scientists have started to find these particles in an astonishing range of products, including table salt and honey, bottled and tap water, shellfish, and beer. In one recent study. 83% of tap water in seven countries was found to contain plastic microfibers. When the snow melts in Canada to reveal a winter's worth of Tim Hortons cups and lids, every person in this country notices the plastic litter that surrounds us. Many of us know of the vast and accumulating patches of garbage in the ocean. I hear shoppers in the produce aisles of my local grocery store grumbling at the increasing size of the plastic that encases the organic arugula. None of this really matters much. Do I care that sea turtles are choking to death on the plastic grocery bags I use every day? Sort of, but certainly not enough to inconvenience myself. But if it turns out that my two boys have a dramatically increased chance of contracting prostate cancer because of all the plastic particles that are implanted in their growing bodies, now you've got my attention. Make it stop, please. Forget recycling. We can't recycle ourselves out of this problem. The issue is our society's addiction to plastic itself. Those plastic microfibers I mentioned, scientists are now saying that one of the primary sources in our drinking water is the lint that comes off the synthetic fabric of our clothing. It's not just the plastic we're throwing away that's the problem; it's the plastic items we surround ourselves with every day. The new science on plastic microparticles is stunning, and I'm guessing only the tip of a toxic iceberg. On March 31, 1880, the good people of Wabash, Indiana, population 320, launched a technological revolution. On top of the town's courthouse, they mounted two bars with a 3,000 candle power bulb at both ends of each. They then started up a steam engine to generate electricity, and at 8 p.m., flipped a switch. Sparks showered, and Wabash became the first electrically lit city in the world. The strange, weird light, exceeded in power only by the sun. Rendered the square as light as midday, one witness reported. 
men fell on their knees, groans were uttered at the sight, and many were dumb with amazement. A century and a quarter later, electric light turns night into day around the globe. In the first world atlas of artificial night sky brightness, based on high resolution satellite data and released in 2001, The heavily developed urban areas of Japan, Western Europe, and the United States blaze like amusement parks. We flood the heavens with so much artificial light that nearly two thirds of the world's people can no longer see the Milky Way. On a clear, dark night, far from light polluted skies, roughly 2,500 stars can be seen by the naked eye. For people living in the suburbs of New York, that number decreases to 250. Residents of Manhattan are lucky to see 15. Moreover, as the stars fade from view, more and more research is suggesting that excessive exposure to artificial night light can alter basic biological rhythms in animals, change predator prey relationships, And even trigger deadly hormonal imbalances in humans. Many creatures are genetically programmed to navigate by the dim glow of the stars and the moon. For them, night lights can be deadly. Michael Mazur, founder of the Toronto based Fatal Light Awareness Program, estimates that 100 million songbirds crash into lit buildings in North America each year. Likewise, artificial light is a source of confusion for the relatives of butterflies that are active at night. Rod Crawford, of the Burke Museum at the University of Washington, believes that light pollution may be the leading cause after habitat loss. Of the decline of the spectacular giant silk moths that were once a source of summer visual delight. The farther from lights and altered habitats you get, the more moths you find, he says. Kenneth Frank, a Philadelphia physician who also studies insects, says that light lured moths often miss their brief opportunities to mate. Or are killed by larger, light stalking creatures. Bright lights also disrupt migration routes, confining some moth populations to isolated islands of darkness. But Frank admits that the situation of the moths is unlikely to cause public concern. Never argue against something on behalf of moths, he warns. People will just laugh at you. Talk about ecosystems instead. Square Wallet is an innovative new app, application, that is changing the way we spend our money. Here's how it works you link your credit card to the app, shop, take your items to a cashier at a participating retailer, and, as the company's website says, simply say your name at checkout to pay. Your name and photograph appear on the register, the cashier gives you a nod, and you walk happily out the door with what you wanted to buy. This kind of seamless convenience has obvious advantages, but it comes with hidden costs. Technology makes it possible to get movies, games, and books the moment we want them and to worry about money later. It's a payment system that encourages instant gratification. Interestingly, however, research suggests that we derive greater happiness from goods we pay for immediately but don't use for some time than we do from goods we use now but pay for later. The app's chief appeal is that it makes payment essentially invisible. Which is exactly what makes it so dangerous. The app soothes the pain connected to handing over hard earned money, but numbing that pain is tricky. Just as the sensation of burning tells you to pull your hand from the stove, the pain of paying can keep spending in check. This isn't just a metaphor. 
Paying high prices for goods and services activates the region of the brain associated with the sensation of actual physical pain. When MBA students were given the opportunity to bid on tickets to a sporting event, those who had to pay in cash bid roughly half as much as those who were permitted to charge. It hurts to hand over cash, so we're less likely to overspend and thus less likely to sink into debt. According to the Census Bureau, the median American household debt in 2011 was $70,000. Nearly half of Americans report worrying about debt. Though accumulating debt is sometimes sensible, research shows that it exerts an enormous negative influence on happiness. Prepayment reduces the dread of debt and also increases the happiness connected with possession. In a recent study, researchers in Europe gave 99 people the chance to buy a gift basket filled with treats. Some got the basket right away and paid later. Others got the basket only after paying in full. Everyone then rated how much joy and contentment their gift baskets gave. Although the baskets were identical, they brought more happiness to those who paid in advance. Perhaps this explains why people frequently experience a happiness boost in the weeks before a vacation. Stuck in an office, the anticipation of the beach is almost as enjoyable as the beach itself. Delayed pleasure not only increases anticipatory excitement, but also enhances the pleasure once it is eventually enjoyed. In one study, students were selected to eat a piece of chocolate, but some had to wait 30 minutes before they could eat it, while others ate the chocolate immediately. Those who had to wait were more likely to fantasize about the chocolate and visualize what it would be like to taste it. And fantasies matter, because waiting enhanced enjoyment and increased people's desire to buy more chocolate. The danger with delayed consumption is that raised expectations result in disappointment when the purchase doesn't live up to our hopes. Luckily, the mind paints over minor gaps between expectations and reality. In a recent study, People enjoyed a video game more if they were presented with tempting details about it before they played. And this was true even when researchers offered them a low-quality version of the game. Ironically, some of the coolest innovations of the past decades may be undermining our happiness. Technologies that push payment into the future making paying so convenient that it's practically painless, put us in danger of overspending. Those that allow us to have everything immediately rob us of the anticipation period. The challenge for the next generation of innovation lies in combining the vast potential of computer technology with fundamental principles of happiness science. Social norms are unwritten rules that govern the way that people behave within a society or group. These norms provide stability in the long run, preventing the society from decaying into chaos and ensuring that even monumental change happens slowly. But they also strongly influence individuals to conform to society. For instance, one study in the 1950s showed this very clearly. New students at a university were randomly assigned to live among either conservative students or liberal students. The researchers observed that these new students gradually adapted their values and beliefs over time to fit the norms of their surroundings. Other studies have shown that people followed group norms even when they had direct evidence that contradicted the norm. For example, in one study, people were asked to estimate the length of a line drawn on a piece of paper. People's estimates followed a group norm even in cases when people could see with their own eyes 
that the group was wrong. Social norms often stifle creativity in groups. To the extent that creativity is the result of thinking outside the box, groups do not normally reward creative individuals, but instead ignore them or even push them out of the group completely. This often works to the detriment of many businesses who strive to attract creative talent to their organization only to see them become unproductive under the pressure of conformance to norms. Not only businesses, but also educational systems suffer from this institutional tendency. The science advisor to the Japanese government, Kiyoshi Kurokawa, declared to the Chronicle of Higher Education, I'm almost exploding at the way the university system bangs down the nail that sticks up. He further complains, our young people are not being allowed to excel. One way to encourage creativity and overcome the influence of social norms can be taken from a study by Ed Arves Yorno et al., 2006. In one part of the study, they asked two groups of participants to create posters and suddenly gave each group a norm about words and images. For one group, the importance of words was emphasized, while for the other group, the importance of images was emphasized. The researchers also heightened the participants' group identity by emphasizing their group membership. Afterward, the two groups judged a leaflet provided by the researchers, which consisted of 90% images. In their judgments, participants equated creativity with following the group norm. The words group rated the leaflet as less creative than the images group did. A second part of the study with different participants was similar to the first, but the participants' individual rather than group identity was heightened. As a result, the participants' judgments were the opposite. Creativity was perceived as being inconsistent with the group norms. Music can evoke a wide variety of strong emotions, including joy, sadness, fear, and peacefulness or tranquility, and people cite emotional impact and regulation as two of the main reasons why they listen to music. Music can produce feelings of intense pleasure or euphoria in the listener, sometimes experienced as thrills or chills down the spine. Musical pleasure is closely related to the intensity of emotional arousal. Even opposite emotional valences, for example, happy or sad, can be experienced as pleasurable, and listeners often report that the most moving music evokes two or more emotions at once. Music does not have the clear survival benefit associated with food or sex, nor does it display the addictive properties associated with drugs of abuse. Nonetheless, the average person spends a considerable amount of time listening to music, regarding it as one of life's most enjoyable activities. Many believe that music has special mystical properties and that its effects are not readily reducible to a neuronal or neurochemical state. Advances in cognitive neuroscience have challenged this view, with evidence that music affects the same neurochemical systems of reward as other reinforcing stimuli. In one of his dark moments, Pascal said that all men's unhappiness came from a single cause, his inability to remain quietly in a room. Diversion, distraction, fantasy, change of fashion, food, love, and landscape. We need them as the air we breathe. Without change, our brains and bodies rot. The man who sits quietly in a shuttered room is likely to be mad tortured by illusions and introspection. Some American brain specialists researched the brains of travelers using x-rays. They found that changes of scenery and awareness of the passage of seasons through the year stimulated the rhythms of the brain, increasing a sense of well-being. Monotonous surroundings and tedious regular activities wove patterns which produced fatigue, nervous disorders, apathy, self-disgust, and violent reactions. It's hardly surprising, then, that a generation protected from the cold by central heating 
from the heat by air conditioning, carted in clean transports from one house or hotel to another, should feel the need for journeys of mind or body, or for the exciting journeys of music and dance. We spend far too much time in shuttered rooms. Children need paths to explore, to take bearings on the earth in which they live, as a navigator takes bearings on familiar landmarks. If we search the memories of childhood, we remember the paths first, things and people second. Paths down the garden, the way to school, the way round the house, corridors through the long grass. Tracking the paths of animals was the first and most important part of early humans' education. The late Catherine Graham, the first female CEO of a Fortune 500 company, once said, To love what you do and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? Ms. Graham, who guided the Washington Post Company for decades with her passion for quality journalism, was ahead of her time in many ways. But her insights about how meaningful work brings joy to life date back to ancient Greece. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle wrote that people achieve eudaimonia, a contented state of flourishing, when they fully use their unique talents, thereby fulfilling their basic function in life. In the 20th century, the psychologist Abraham Maslow restated the concept as self-actualization, which he placed at the top of his hierarchy of human needs. Most recently, academics in the field of positive psychology have underscored the link between meaningful activities and happiness. Meaning is the motivation in your life. It's finding what engages you, what makes your heart beat faster, what gives you energy and creates passion. Meaning enables you to push yourself to the limits of your capabilities and beyond. Without meaning, work is a slog between weekends. With meaning, any job can become a calling. By deploying your greatest strengths in service of a meaningful purpose that transcends everyday goals, you open yourself up to long-lasting happiness. Meaning is a defining characteristic among female leaders. When asked what the most important factors are in choosing a job and staying in it, women consistently cite the meaningful elements of the work. Women like Amina Susanna Agbaje, who started her own law firm to fulfill a childhood dream, have a profound belief in what they are doing. That leads to a higher level of commitment and gives you the courage to plunge ahead, no matter what the odds and no matter who says, no, you can't. Finding meaning helps you set audacious goals and venture forth to meet them. An important difference between persons and other creatures is that only persons can be morally responsible for what they do. When we accept that someone is a morally responsible agent, this typically involves more than holding a particular belief about him. It entails a willingness to adopt certain attitudes toward that person and to behave toward him in certain kinds of ways. Imagine, for example, that you return home one evening and find your treasured Waterford vase shattered on the dining room floor. Discovering that the vase has been purposely shattered by a malicious houseguest will give rise to a set of reactions much different than those which would seem appropriate were you to discover that the vase had been accidentally toppled from the shelf by your clumsy cat. In the latter case, you might feel regret and perhaps even anger at your cat, but you would hardly feel the same sort of resentment and moral indignation that would seem warranted had your guest intentionally broken the vase in order to hurt you. Moreover, 
it would be appropriate to blame your guest and to hold him responsible for the misdeed in a way much different from the way in which you might discipline your cat and try to train him not to climb on the furniture in the future. Of course, to make these claims is not to deny that there is one sense in which both the guest and the cat are responsible for breaking the vase in the respective scenarios. Each is causally responsible. Each plays a causal role in bringing about the destruction of the vase. But whereas both persons and non-persons can be causally responsible for an event, only persons can be morally responsible. For many people, questions of moral responsibility are associated primarily with wrongdoing, like that described in the preceding example. According to this view, questions concerning who may legitimately be held responsible are seen to stem from more practical questions concerning who should be blamed and punished for their misdeeds. Similarly, a concern to understand the propriety of our responsibility ascriptions is driven mostly by a concern to understand what justifies the punitive measures we take toward those who injure us and violate the norms of society. Such a view helps to give expressions such as, I am going to hold you responsible, or I promise to find out who is responsible for this a mostly negative connotation, calling to mind the retributive attitudes and harsh treatment that await wrongdoers. In contrast to this approach, however, others take a broader view of moral responsibility. They associate responsibility not only with negative responses like resentment and blame, but also with more positive responses such as gratitude, respect, and praise. To see the intuition behind this view, imagine that you once again return home after work. This time, instead of finding a shattered vase, you discover that your neighbor's exceedingly ugly tree, which had long blocked the otherwise spectacular view from your living room, has been knocked down. As in the previous examples, your reactions will vary depending upon what you subsequently learn about the causes that led to the tree's demise. For instance, your reaction would presumably depend on whether the tree's uprooting was the result of a fortuitous gust of wind or the efforts of your considerate neighbor who removed the eyesore as a birthday surprise for you. In the former case, you might feel fortunate or happy, but you would hardly feel the gratitude and desire to praise that would seem appropriate had your thoughtful neighbor torn down the offensive tree just to please you. The point stressed by the proponent of the broader conception of responsibility is that there is a spectrum of reactions, including positive reactions, that are appropriately applied only to persons.